In the Middle East, two great religions arose which were based on a different concept, monotheism. These two religions continue to have powerful influence in the world. Despite their belief in a common godhead, they have often waged war against each other. Each has believed its cause to have had a divine blessing. Judaism has had most impact on the West since Christianity has its roots there and has incorporated the Jewish holy texts into its own. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So sacred is the name of God to the Jews that it is represented in holy texts by four letters, YHWH. When Hebrew texts are read aloud, the word Adonai, or Lord, is substituted for the holy name. The Jews have long believed that they have a special relationship with God and regard themselves as his chosen people. By the expression chosen, uh, as scripture really teaches, we are chosen to be an example to others. God has shown us the way to live life to its greatest advantage uh, as decent, caring people which was very important, particularly in the ancient pagan world, which still believed in human sacrifice and uh, uh, um, people were quite atrocious to each other, particularly if you belonged to another tribe. The Jews were chosen, as Isaiah says, to be a light to the nations. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. From the outset, Judaism has abhorred idolatry. God is not to be found in a piece of wood or stone. He is everywhere, yet he is hidden. Yet it is because God is hidden that he is so powerful. According to the Talmud, the body of Jewish law, it was Abraham who first discovered the universality of God. Well, Jewish tradition has a wonderful story that um, Abraham's father was an idol worshipper, but he also made idols. This was his business. You know, you could go to a shop and you could buy a new idol for, I was going to say for Christmas, but it's not quite. Um, and that Abraham, trying to demonstrate that they were useless, um, the story goes that he prepared a dish and he said to his parents, this is for the big idol that stands in the corner, you see. And then he set about with a, something like a baseball bat and smashed them all to pieces and set the big one. And he put this baseball bat in its hand. And when his father came rushing, he said, what's happened? He said, well, all the other idols saw this food, so they all started grabbing for it, and the big idol was so angry, he smashed them all to pieces. His father gave him a good smack and said, don't be ridiculous. They're only bits of stone and wood. How can you possibly say that? He said, well, if that's the case, then why do you worship them? Um, and from that, we say that Abraham realized that the world of nature is governed by one supreme force, not by a multiplicity of gods, and therefore he discovered the concept of monotheism of, of the one supreme controlling God. Judaism has a twofold purpose. The first purpose is to make God known. The second purpose is to teach people how he wishes to be served. As Moses ben Maimon, the 12th century Jewish philosopher pointed out, the most essential Jewish concept of God is his indivisible unity. God is one. The oneness of any of the single things extant in the universe is unlike his unity. He is not one as a species, since this includes numerous individuals, nor one as a body, since this is indivisible into parts and sections, but a unity that is unique in the world. God is in control. He has not abandoned the universe to the laws of nature. He is creator and regulator of history. Some Jews have rebelled against this idea. 
The most famous of these heretics was Spinoza. He maintained that God was identical with the world and nature. As a result, the Jewish court of Amsterdam excommunicated him in 1656. We have always had great philosophers, sometimes whose thoughts and ideals and philosophies have diverged from what we would call strict orthodox Judaism. While, of course, it is quite right for people to use the intellect that God has given them, nevertheless, Scripture and the Talmud and our rabbis have laid down um, the concepts and principles which Judaism holds. And if people feel that they diverge from them, while we don't uh, disagree that they have the right to hold those views, we must also insist on a certain orthodoxy with regard to the general public and the general members of the community, they should not be led astray. Spinoza was one of those great philosophers in many ways. We have some today as well, whose views regarding the absolute authority and divinity of the law uh, may not be quite in accordance with orthodoxy. I suppose that's true of all faiths. Judaism believes God is met in a direct existentialist encounter. The medieval Jewish philosopher Rabbi Judah Halevi pointed out the gulf between Jewish and Western concepts of God. I understand the difference between the God and the Lord, and I see how great is the difference between the God of Abraham and the God of Aristotle. And God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. The creation story is about a human being endowed with free will, responding to the will of God. Man stands midway between the angels and the beasts. Explaining the use of free will is not particularly easy. Um, God has placed us in this world and we have a choice. God has given us the free will of choice. Um, if we didn't have free will, there would be no more of them puppets doing whatever the master uh, has, has decreed. By being given free will, we have the choice to be good or evil. We have the choice that we make every day. Um, and the Jew is expected by his love of God and his understanding, as we said before, that God knows and sees all things, that what we do, we are answerable for. Uh, this is the principle of faith that we have, that I believe that the Almighty rewards those who keep his commandments and will punish those who don't. That is to say that he knows what we are doing and that there is a purpose in being good. It's not that uh, uh, somebody once said, look, we're all going to die, we all finish up in the cemetery. What difference does it make? We might as well enjoy ourselves and do what we like on the way and that's it. But if you believe that you are answerable, that there is a world beyond, uh, where there is reward and punishment, then you understand that there is more purpose to life than just doing what you like and having a good time. Man must choose God because he loves God. Paradise must not be used by God as an inducement, nor hell as a deterrent. In the story of Job, God reproaches Job's friends, even though they are on his side. Job, on the other hand, rails against God, yet God rewards him. Judaism has always used reasons and the intellect as the basis for its faith and religious certitude. But communion between man and God at a spiritual level is at its heart. Moses ben Maimon emphasized the depth of this relationship. Man's love of God is identical with his knowledge of him. He likened this love to that of a lovesick man for a woman. The most famous biblical expression of this is in the Song of Songs. Set me as a seal upon thine heart, as a seal upon thine arm. For love is as strong as death, jealousy is cruel as the grave. The 613 commandments of the Torah hold together this relationship between man and God. This is not a master-servant relationship, though. Man is a partner with God in his work of creation. This is accomplished through service to one's fellow human beings. 
Rabbi Judah Halevi in the 12th century beautifully summed up this relationship. When far from thee I die, while yet in life, but if I cling to thee I live, though I should die. Strict observance of the Sabbath is central to Judaism. Jewish mystics said that the six days of work represent the masculine element in creation. They described the seventh day as the Shabbos queen, or Shabbos bride. Well, the importance of the Sabbath is that it is a, a separate day from the rest of the week. As scripture simply puts it in the Ten Commandments, for six days shall you labor and do all your work, but the Sabbath is a, is a, is a special day to the Lord your God. In other words, there is the physical and the spiritual in life. Yes, we have to work. In fact, work is an ethic. Uh, people being lazy and sitting around doing nothing is not regarded in Judaism as being a particularly good thing. Even somebody who won millions on the lottery, you know, you would still um, not be absolved of working. Yes, it may make it easier for you, um, but just to waste your life sitting around doing nothing or going on holidays and touring around would not be regarded as being a good thing. You're not using your life usefully. Uh, for most of us, we have the, the daily grind, I suppose, is what one might say, to earn our crust of bread. But the Sabbath is a very special day. This is set aside for spiritual benefit. It is also, very specifically, family time. Uh, as the chief rabbi has pointed out, today families don't sit and eat together. People run in, grab something to eat, or sit in front of the telly. Um, families don't operate as a unit. The Friday night and Sabbath lunchtime is a very important time for the family to be together, to share together, um, not only the spiritual joy of the Sabbath, but also everything that a family shares to talk about what they've been doing and their interests and what they want to do and what they hope to do, and parents and children talking together. Um, so it's very much family day. It is a spiritual occasion. And it is a happy day when we can set aside everything that we have to do during the week and just relax and be together. That is an important aspect. And I suppose in modern society, even more so than it ever was before. In the New Testament, Jesus and his disciples often came into conflict with the religious authorities for flouting Sabbath restrictions. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Primarily, it is derived from the 39 types of work, that is a technical term work, that were involved in building the tabernacle in the wilderness, such as um, smelting, because they had to do the various metals, sewing, because the ladies sewed the curtains, uh, beating things, because they had to be beaten into shape, hammering, um, using uh, hammer and nails, uh, planing wood, um, all the things that were involved in the building of the tabernacle are prohibited on the Sabbath. But there are also derivatives of that. So in other words, it's not just the major object of work, it is all the things that derive from that. So we observe the Sabbath very strictly. Um, for example, the rabbis say that since you shouldn't write, you shouldn't hold a pen, because you may come to write. Um, you're not allowed to strike a match to make a flame, because obviously they have to have fires and so forth. So you shouldn't touch matches because you may accidentally come to, 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 to strike a match. Um, in many ways it becomes a sixth sense. On the Sabbath I don't turn on a light. So when you would automatically walk into a room and just reach for the light switch, on the Sabbath there's a sort of a sixth sense that you don't. And yet there have been odd occasions when you forget yourself, but Judaism is, is quite tolerant of people that make mistakes. So you know, I was visiting somebody on the Sabbath and I tripped as I went in and I put my hand out and instead of just holding the wall, I touched the light switch and turned the lights on. Well, it happened, it was an accident, you know. Actually, I did that once here in the synagogue. I caught the sleeve of my robe on the, on the main switch and turned out all the lights in the synagogue in one go. Was, Who did that? The rabbi. <laughs> but Judaism is tolerant of, of, of errors and mistakes because we're human beings. Uh, the Sabbath is observed strictly um, in order to teach you that it is a different day. It's not your day. The six days are your days. The seventh day is the Lord's day. This is the Sabbath to the Lord, and therefore we observe it strictly.
The Sabbath is for man to experience the majesty of creation and acknowledge the mastery of God. It is also in our leisure that we show our innermost selves. The Talmud says a man's character is tested in three ways, by his pocket, by his cup, and by his temper. It's taken from rabbinic literature, and there are many examples of what one might be tempted to call almost rabbinic hyperbole, that these are the most essential things, or these are the most... It was the way that the rabbis used for underlying importance of moderate behavior. So in other words, Judaism has very, well, I suppose it's true to say, to some degree, has a much lower percentage of people who are alcoholic and a much lower percentage of people, like me, who are uh, teetotal. Drink, but in moderation. Uh, by the pocket it is meant how generous a person is with regard to helping those less fortunate, giving charity, um, or helping others when they need help. Um, in scripture, the laws are that, I mean, our ancestors were farmers in the land of Israel, obviously. It says you leave the corner of your field for the poor and for the needy. Well, when it says the corner of the field, how much? It doesn't say. It says it is not specified. If you were generous, you would leave quite a nice, generous corner for the poor to come, as in the Book of Ruth, you know, they used to go down and glean in the fields, whatever. If you were mean, you would leave just the smallest corner possible. Or if you were sort of, you would leave a moderate. And in the same sense, um, a man is judged by how much he gives to charity. And we regard the, the act of charity as being a very important thing. We try to give charity every day. Obviously not Sabbaths and festivals, you can't handle money. The Talmud exhorts Orthodox Jews to spend the day in prayer and study. Observance of the Sabbath, like all the rituals of Judaism, may be seen as a preparation for the ultimate event, the coming of the Messiah. The messianic concept is revolutionary. In most ancient religions, human existence is seen as a perpetual cycle of death and rebirth. In Judaism, there is only one earthly life, but it is a life lived in expectation of a great coming. Judaism is a jubilant and optimistic religion. We haven't given it up, first of all, because anything that is taught to us from Holy Scripture in Judaism is basically biblically uh, rooted um, our teachings forever. Um, the same with the prophets, those uh, prophets who foretold the future, that is from the mouth of God. Um, although you may find different concepts in different parts of the Bible, since it all comes from the mouth of the one God, there is no contradiction. That which God has spoken stands forever, as Isaiah said. Um, yes, uh, flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. And that is a simple principle. We have been taught that ultimately there will come the Messiah who will be the, I don't know whether you want to use the word saviour, will be the, the ruler, the guide of the Jewish people, descended from the royal house of David of the tribe of Judah. And that is what we ultimately believe will happen. We don't sit around waiting for it. We believe that we live our lives as Jews and we do our best, but the Messiah will ultimately come. That is a principle of faith. It's true that Judaism has always placed a great emphasis on law. He who is kind to those who are cruel will end up being cruel to those who are kind. You could say they are very general headings. Um, the reason for that is there are many daily Jewish practices, such as the dietary laws, putting on the prayer straps, wearing the, uh, the fringe garment, that are not in the Ten Commandments. And uh, these are no less part of the law that God has given than the Ten Commandments are. Um, you could say, as I said, the Ten Commandments are very bare, very general headings. Uh, I was discussing one of them with a class this morning. Just let me give you a little illustration. Uh, Honour your father and your mother. Sounds very simple. Um, first of all, what would happen 
in the case of a parent who was verbally, physically or sexually abusive of a child. The child would then be absolved of any uh, duty to honour such a parent. Um, since Holy Scripture always speaks of a blood relationship, how would this apply to a step-parent, a mother who has married again, or a father who's married again, or a child who had been adopted? Um, while I would certainly say that an adopted child has a duty of care, love and affection for the people that brought him up, because in a sense, I suppose, a father and a mother are people that do care for you and bring you up. But since Scripture speaks specifically of a blood relationship, it would be perhaps less an obligation on an adopted child than on a naturally born child. So the commandment has a much wider application than anybody would imagine just by reading, honour your father and your mother. Um, and that would apply to all of the Ten Commandments. There is so much in each one. They're just basic, bareheaded. Yes, they are fundamental, but they're not the totality of Judaism because we believe that the whole of the Torah was given uh, to the Jewish people from the mouth of God and that these are all teaching. So even those things that are not mentioned in the Ten Commandments are still um, obligatory upon us to observe as laws. Every word of, of, of Scripture is of equal value. The Jews believe that once man begins to interpret the law himself, all sorts of evil and atrocities follow. When we perform an action, we often question our motives for doing it. If our motives aren't pure, should we still do it? Judaism argues that we should. Whatever we do, we should be at least thinking human beings as to why we're doing whatever it is. Certainly by religious education, people should understand clearly when they're doing ritual observances or acts or whatever it may be as to why they're doing it. Judaism really believes that God has given us commandments which are amplified and expounded by the rabbis and sages of many generations to make us better human beings, to make us more godly human beings. The act of worship, to say prayers, yes, uh, it is important, but to tell God that he is the king, that he is the Lord of lords, that he is the ruler, that he is great, that he is wonderful, he knows that. For goodness sake, does he need us to keep saying it? We keep saying it because we need to impress it upon ourselves, not on him. It needs us to be aware of it that makes us better human beings. That when we go out in the world, we are kind and generous to others. We are aware of our faults and flaws, and therefore we should at least be concessionary to others for their faults and flaws. Um, why don't we go shoplifting? Why don't we mug old ladies and snatch their bags? Because we believe that God is watching us, that God sees us, and in that sense, because we are more godly people, we don't do it. We love our neighbour as ourselves, and we consider other people in the same way as ourselves. Performing acts of kindness and charity, putting money in a charity box, is showing our concern for others. So therefore, we should think about what we are doing. We should evaluate it from a point of we have been educated to understand what it is we are doing and do it. This is where Christianity and Judaism diverge. Christianity believes man can only be redeemed through faith. Judaism argues it is through good deeds. We learn to love people through treating them decently. The Hebrew word for helping the needy is zedaka, which means justice. It is not an act of love or charity. It is an act of righteousness. There is no distinction between the deserving and undeserving poor. Judaism also believes that giving to the poor should be done on a regular basis, rather than, say, making an annual donation. With each daily act of helping the poor, one becomes a better person. 
Every religion has to face the question of why God allows suffering in his world. This has been a particularly difficult question for Judaism since the Holocaust. How then does Judaism react to the suffering of the Holocaust? Every human being likes to feel that their life is of value and importance. And nobody would like to feel that they have passed from this world and not left some mark. Where there were huge Jewish communities that were wiped out by the Nazis, the survivors, the surviving relatives or friends or whatever, didn't want these people just to become dust and ashes blowing in the wind across Auschwitz and Buchenwald and Kelmenow. They wanted some memorial. And some of these people got together and put together memorial books with pictures, with names, with dates. There was a town called Piotrkov, which is in Poland. They had about 30,000 Jewish people there in 1939. I believe not more than a dozen survived. And these people got together and they put together a memorial book of photos and pictures of the schools, of the rabbis, of the synagogues, of the people, um, you know, people that were on the swimming team, people that played games. They didn't want thousands and thousands just to be blotted out and gone. And that is why Yad Vashem, the memorial center in Israel, has collated the information of people just to have records of people who lived, that they should not just have died and gone from this world. The final point is that the Holocaust, while it bears witness to the horror, bears witness to the heroism. So the Holocaust also bears witness to the nobility that can be in some people. And to those people, we, the Jews, say a very, very big thank you. About 70 AD, the Romans crushed the last pockets of Jewish resistance at Masada, and the Jewish people were dispersed throughout the world in what is called the Diaspora. In 1948, the modern state of Israel was created. The Jews returned to the Promised Land, but it was now occupied by the Palestinians. The two nations continue to fight over the land. This is the land that God gave to us. This is the land that God promised our fathers would belong to us forever. And there has never been a moment from the days of Joshua till now when there have not been Jewish communities living in the land of Israel. That's absolutely true. That is irrefutable. In the 1860s, when there was the first census conducted by the Turkish authorities of Jerusalem, the Jews were nearly 60% of the population of Jerusalem. And, of course, when it came to 1948, if they talk about the people who were living there were Palestinians, there were more than 650,000 Jewish Palestinians, if you want to argue the point. Judaism is divided into two schools of belief, Orthodox and Reform. The latter no longer accept the teachings of the Torah unquestioningly. They believe many of the old tenets are outdated. Judaism must move with the times. We haven't come through three and a half thousand years of history just to suddenly disappear. Uh, I must tell you, though, we are one of the tiniest nations in this world. People are not aware of that. One of the tiniest nations in this world. And yet, can you name a newspaper that does not, each day, have something either about Israel or about the Jews. Jews are news. That happens to be, you know, the truth. There are wars going on all over the world. Some of them people don't even know about. They never... Israel, news. Jews, news, you know? And uh, so we haven't come this far suddenly to disappear. Um, yes, it may be that there are nations that would wish that we would disappear and, and troubles would end. wouldn't really, it's not true. But um, I am sure that the Almighty in his way chose us for one reason. We have a tenacity for self-survival. Um, so the future of Jews and Judaism is bound up together.
in as much as there will always be very orthodox Jews, uh, moderate Jews, um, traditional Jews, uh, reform Jews, put it how you like, put whatever label you want on it. But the future of Judaism is sure. As a matter of fact, there are more and more of our youngsters who are coming back to um, what I might call orthodox Judaism because they don't like the compromises that the parents and grandparents made. And Israel frequently has so many youngsters that go back there, particularly like summer holidays, for the various courses that are offered by the uh, Jewish seminaries uh, to learn Hebrew, to be with their people again. Um, this is almost like a Jewish revival in many ways. And um, so we are going to be around for a lot longer. And I don't have any fear for the future of Judaism or the Jewish people. There is no God but Allah. Muhammad is his messenger. The Prophet Muhammad was born in Mecca in about 570 AD, the son of a poor merchant named Abdullah. In 610, when he was about 40, Muhammad went into a cave on Mount Hira to meditate. There, he claimed to have seen a vision of the Archangel Gabriel. At first, Muhammad refused to believe in the vision. He was sure he had gone mad. Halfway up Mount Hira, a voice from heaven stopped him. O oh Muhammad, thou art the apostle of God, and I am Gabriel. Once Muhammad was convinced of the truth of his vision, he began to have more, in which he received the word of God. Muhammad never regarded himself as divine, but as the last of a long line of messengers sent by God. These stretched back to Abraham and Moses, and also included Jesus. Muhammad believed that over the centuries, both Judaism and Christianity had blurred God's message to mankind. Because Muhammad believed that there was an essential Abrahamic revelation, which had been given to Moses, to Jesus, and various other prophets, um, he saw his message as coming to um, renew that original message, which was essentially the same for all prophets, but which all communities over time corrupted um, as a result of innovations, um, bringing in non-monotheistic ideas. One particular thing he very much criticised was the fact that the Christians had introduced the idea of the Trinity. He believed that was uh, in opposition to the true monotheistic message given by God. The word Islam means submission to God and prayer is an admission of that surrender. Muhammad soon realized the need to create a united Muslim community. To this end, he launched the first jihad, or holy war. He attacked Quraysh caravans, using the loot to finance the war. His armies enjoyed immediate success. To the vanquished, it was a sign that Allah was on Muhammad's side many embraced Islam. In 630, Muhammad attacked Mecca. The city surrendered without a fight. Muhammad headed for the holy shrine of the Kaaba. In one wall of the shrine is set a black stone in a silver frame. Muslims claim that the archangel Gabriel gave the stone to Abraham. Others say it is a meteor. The Kaaba is um, a square structure, the word actually means uh, a cube, um, and it houses the, the black stone, which is alternately believed to have been given by God to Gabriel to give to the community, or some people argue that it's a meteorite. Um, the importance of a Kaaba is, however, that it symbolises contact between heaven and earth, and contact between man and God. So it's a sort of central point for Muslims, uh, similar in fact to the Dome of the Rock in the Jerusalem, which is another meteorite, which is considered to have great significance for Muslims. So I think you can see it as a sanctuary which stands at the heart of Islam because if you like, it's the perfect point of communion between heaven and earth, man and God. Muhammad found the Kaaba surrounded by 360 pagan idols. 
In order to purify the shrine and return it to monotheism, he smashed them to pieces. Since then, all idols and pictures have been banned from mosques as symbols of polytheism. Muhammad returned to Medina, where he contracted a fever and died two years later. In some ways, Muhammad can be compared to Moses. Moses comes up very frequently in the Quran as one of the key Abrahamic prophets. And he is seen in the Quran in many ways as being the forerunner to Muhammad, the person who he actually is said to have announced the coming of Muhammad in the future, but he's also a model. He's seen as someone who had similar experiences to Muhammad, um, rejection at times by his community. Um, but also he is seen as an individual who had a very particular communion with God. Uh, a special honorific title for Moses is Kalim Allah, which means someone who speaks or is spoken to, in this case, by God. And Muhammad, of course, had something of the same role. He became the spokesman for God. So there's seen as being quite a close correlation between the life and experiences of both Moses and Muhammad, and Moses is seen as announcing Muhammad's future coming. When a leader dies, the movement he founded may die with him. Abu Bakr was on hand to continue Muhammad's work. Muhammad had been unable to write. He had committed the Quran to memory as Gabriel had dictated it to him. The word was then passed on to his followers through sermons. Reciters would then communicate these texts to others. I don't think that the verbal transmission of texts necessarily leads to more errors than the written transmission of texts. I think when you think of, uh, if you consider medieval copyists' work, it's very evident that all kinds of mistakes can creep in when copying the written word. And in a similar way, it's true that there can be errors in oral transmission. But at the same time, I think one has to remember that the early community was a community whose whole tradition was an oral tradition. Their memories were extremely highly trained and the margin of error was a great deal less than it would be in a modern literate society where people don't bother to memorize the, the bulk of materials they need in their everyday lives. Soon after Muhammad's death, Islam began to splinter into rival sects as others fought over the succession. The Muslim community was already dividing along the lines which led to the later emergence of different sects. The main orthodox sect is the Sunnites. They follow the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet, preserved by the scholars who derived Islamic law from these sources and accept all the caliphs as legitimate. The other main sect is the Shiaism. Shi'i Muslims also recognize the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad, but they believe that the caliph, whom they call the Imam, should be a blood descendant of the Prophet in the line of Ali and Fatima. They believe that Ali and the Imams descended from him before the line died out were additional sources of revelation. The majority of Shi'i Muslims believe in 12 Imams, but some believe that there were only seven. The third sect is the Kayujites, who disagree with both the Sunnites and the Shiites. It was the Kayujite who killed Ali. Karujism was originally political. The Karujites believed that the most spiritually and politically able Muslim should be caliph. The Karujites are a minority sect today. The main divisions which emerged in early Islam, which have subsequently become doctrinal or theological distinctions, actually began as political differences. So the three main sects, if you want to use that word, which emerged in Islam, the Sunni, the Shi, and the Khariji, can all be traced to different attitudes to religio-political leadership within Islam. Islam is built upon the creed, which is the profession of faith and the six articles of faith. The creed is one simple sentence. There is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. The first article is belief in God, who is indivisible, almighty, merciful, eternal, and invisible. 
The second article is belief in angels. Muslims recognize four archangels, Gabriel, Michael, Israfil, and Israel. They also believe in the devil, Al-Shaitan, a fallen angel who disobeyed Allah and was cast out of paradise. I think it's quite interesting that the angels are actually seen as having lesser status to mankind, even though they are made of light and mankind is made of earth, because they, because they don't have free will, because they aren't, in a sense, independent. That despite all, their, all the glory of their role, it is a role that is completely defined for them. And in the Qur'an, you have a situation where the angels are actually told to bow down before Adam, and they're a little bit reticent about this, and they sort of ask why, and they're told it's because Adam knows the names of things, whereas they do not know the names of things, which gives mankind a higher status than the angels uh, from a theological perspective. The third article is belief in the scriptures. The Quran is believed to correct errors that crept into the Torah, the Psalms of David, and the Gospels. It should be read aloud in the original Arabic. The fourth article is belief in prophets. These include the prophets of the Old Testament and Jesus Christ. They are regarded as Muslims because they submitted to God. This relates to the fact that Islam sees itself as Abrahamic monotheism. The fifth article is belief in the Day of Judgment. Um, the Islamic and Christian concepts of judgment are fairly similar. Again, you have um, a correlation that's quite natural given that these are both Abrahamic religions. The sources are the same. Muslims also believe that one's good and bad deeds will be weighed up and that at the Day of Judgment people will be sorted into those who are going to go to heaven and those who are going to go to hell. So I say, although there are small differences, broadly speaking, there's a great deal of similarity between Muslim and Christian views of the Day of Judgment. The sixth article is belief that human life is ordained by Allah. All Muslims must pray five times a day whilst facing in the direction of the Kaaba in Mecca. All Muslims must undertake zakat or almsgiving to ensure their salvation. All Muslims must observe the fast of Ramadan during the ninth month of the Muslim calendar. All Muslims who are physically fit must make the Hajj or pilgrimage to Mecca at least once in their lifetime. Um, the, the Hajj is the annual pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, so it's not any pilgrimage. Muslims can't perform the Hajj at any time during the year. There's a specific season, if you like, when the Hajj takes place. And the fact that it is a communal act is what makes it so important because it's a communal act which draws Muslims together from all over the world and acts as a symbol of the unity of Muslims wherever they may live, whatever language they may speak, whatever their colour, their ethnicity and so on. During the Hajj, Muslims uh, circumambulate the Kaaba and touch the black stone. Again, this is this is a ceremony which is considered very important for Muslims because it's, it's the great leveller. Everyone is equal when they're within the sanctuary area of Mecca and particularly as they circumambulate the Kaaba. Men and women circumambulate together. There is a set dress um, called ihram, which is uh, you have to purify yourself before putting on this dress. Uh, so there's no differences based on wealth, social status, every, gender. Everyone is completely equal as they go round the Kaaba, that point which is the point of perfect communion between man and God. So I think in a nutshell, Muslims consider the Hajj to be the ultimate symbol of Muslim unity and also Muslim equality and Muslim contact with God. Recently, terrorist attacks by fanatical Muslim fundamentalists have led to a spate of Islamophobia. Both Muslims and mosques have been attacked in retaliation. Fundamentalism itself isn't monolithic. Um, I think there's a tendency to see fundamentalism as meaning extremist militant groups. But of course, um, trying to live a life 
similar to the life lived by the early community, can be a very pacific and pious experience. And the majority of fundamentalists are pacific in their orientation. They just want to try and recreate that early community, which they see as um, a more valid paradigm than the way Islam has become over time. And in some ways, this is a very positive thing. Um, Pacific fundamentalism, for instance, tends to be more democratic. It tries to give all members of the community their say. Um, even though most fundamentalist women wear the headscarf, that's their personal choice. And it is actually something which enables them to then participate very much in the community. What they say by putting on the veil is that I am... Um, I don't wish to be viewed as a sexual being. I wish to be viewed simply as a Muslim, and I wish to have my say. And in a lot of fundamentalist communities, uh, women play a much more active role than in traditional Islamic communities. For instance, in fundamentalist mosques, you often have a larger female congregation than you would have in a, a traditional mosque where women often wouldn't bother to go at all, or wouldn't feel that they really had to go at all. To many Westerners, Islam seems to treat women as inferior beings. They point to such practices as the wearing of the shadur and burqa. I think the traditional Islamic position vis-à-vis -vis women is not radically different to the traditional Jewish or Christian position vis-à-vis -vis women. And in all cases, the uh, gender relations were naturally influenced by the cultures which preceded them. They were all patriarchal cultures which were concerned about ensuring that property remained within the male line, which made it important to control females' freedom, their sexuality, and so on. And those kind of attitudes were carried into all the Abrahamic faiths. Islam in, in that is no different, really. It is almost 14 centuries since Muhammad fled from Mecca to Medina. Islam quickly spread. It is estimated there are now some 1.7 billion Muslims throughout the world. But whether one believes or not, there can be no doubt of Muhammad's influence and the beauty of the Quran. To God belongs all that is in the heavens and in the earth, and God encompasses everything.